COVID-19 has already claimed more than 4 million lives. In the United States, over 1 million deaths from COVID-19 have been recorded, approximately two years after the first cases of the disease transformed life in the country. The milestone of 1 million deaths represents about one death for every 327 Americans, or more than the entire population of San Francisco. In the United Kingdom, a total of 177,000 977 deaths related to COVID-19 have been recorded so far. The daily death rate in the country has varied, but the latest peak was recorded on February 24, 2021, with 443 deaths in a single day. So far, in 2024, Brazil has recorded 693,267 deaths. The seven-day moving average of deaths is 173 per day. The pandemic has affected all countries, but low-income, middle-income, and high-income nations have been impacted in different ways. The SARS-CoV-2 virus, responsible for COVID-19, primarily spreads rapidly from person to person through respiratory droplets. When an infected person coughs, sneezes, talks, or sings, small droplets containing the virus are released into the air. People nearby, usually within two meters, can inhale these droplets and become infected. By close contact, the virus can also be transmitted through direct contact with contaminated surfaces or objects. If a person touches a contaminated surface or object and then touches their face, mouth, nose, or eyes, they can become infected in aerosols. In addition to larger droplets, the virus can also remain in the air in smaller particles called aerosols. These aerosols can linger in the air for longer periods and be inhaled by people in indoor environments. By asymptomatic individuals. Asymptomatic or presymptomatic individuals, who do not yet show symptoms, can also transmit the virus. And symptoms vary, but the most common ones include fever, dry cough, fatigue, difficulty breathing, loss of taste or smell. Some patients also report muscle aches sore throat, stuffy or runny nose, and diarrhea. But there are tests that aid diagnosis such as PCR, polymerase chain reaction, detects the virus's genetic material in respiratory samples. Antigen rapid tests detect viral proteins in respiratory samples, and serology detects antibodies in the blood to determine if the person has had the infection. But there are also prevention methods such as wear a mask, cover your nose and mouth in public places. Social distancing keep at least one meter away from other people. Hand hygiene wash frequently with soap and water or use alcohol gel. Avoid touching the face, especially eyes, mouth, and nose. Ventilation is important. Maintain well-ventilated environments. And vaccination take the recommended doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. During this time, humanity has battled against this virus, and many have been affected. For instance, the struggle of healthcare professionals in combating COVID-19 has been documented with several reports of issues, including healthcare professionals are particularly susceptible to infection. In Brazil, as well as in other countries, thousands of health professionals were removed from professional activities due to having acquired the infection and many died as a result of COVID-19. 3. 4. In Italy, 20% of healthcare workers working on the front lines of COVID-19 care were infected and many died. Data from teams of health professionals who are on the front line of COVID-19 cases show physical and mental exhaustion, difficulties in decision-making and anxiety due to the pain of losing patients and colleagues, in addition to the risk of infection and the possibility of transmission to family members. Healthcare workers who care for their elderly parents or young children are directly affected by school closures and social distancing policies. As the epidemic accelerates, access to personal protective equipment, PPE, for healthcare workers is a constant concern. And we have a scientific article on the fight against COVID-19 that highlights the crucial role of nurses in the fight against COVID-19 in primary healthcare, PHC. It begins as follows. Introduction. The World Health Organization, WHO, declared the outbreak of the SARS-CoV-2 virus as a public health emergency of international concern, one, and subsequently, with the increase in the number of cases and its rapid spread worldwide. The pandemic in March 2022, the Clinical Management Protocol for COVID-19, 
the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 in primary healthcare, PHC, elaborated by the Ministry of Health of Brazil, demonstrates the protagonism of nursing in combating the disease at this level of healthcare. 3. PHC was responsible for attending to mild cases of the disease and the first care for severe cases, stabilizing the condition and referring to the tertiary sector. 3. And in this context, the nurse provides professional care to users with symptoms of COVID-19. The theoretical density and structural complexity of the work process of Brazilian PHC imply the need for collaborative health teams committed to maintaining the right to health of the population, in which the nurse plays an essential role in the care and health surveillance of communities, with nursing consultation being an important tool as it qualifies professional practice through the systematization of care. For In nursing consultations, protocols can be used. Clinical care as instruments used to Qualify care based on scientific evidence, which provides greater security for users and professionals, prevent errors, optimize resources, support decision-making, decision and contribute to the coordination of care. 5. In the current Brazilian scenario with legal support and of an international movement that seeks to strengthen the visibility and appreciation of the profession, the nurse in Context of PHC has stood out for carrying out consultation. Nursing people with symptoms of COVID-19. Autonomous, resolute, and effective way involving care. Integral to the person and health education that reinforce practices. To prevent the spread of the virus. In view of the above, the present study aimed to describe the experiences lived in carrying out consultations. Nursing in PHC in caring for people with symptoms. A COVID-19 method. This is a qualitative, descriptive study of the type. Experience report, which presents the experiences in carrying out. Of nursing consultations in PHC in the care of. People with symptoms of COVID-19. The queries of. Nursing approaches were carried out between May 1st and. November 30th, 2020 in a basic health unit. UBS. In the city of Florianopolis. Santa Catarina. Brazil. UBS has three family health strategy teams, ESF, and is responsible for health care in a territory, with a population of, on average, 7,500 people. Nursing consultations were conducted in light of Wanda Aguiar Horta's theory of basic human needs, 6, and Federal Nursing Council, COFIN, Resolution Number 358 of 2009, 7, Philosophical and Theoretical References, respectively, adopted by the Municipal Health Department of Florianopolis. COFIN clarifies that the nursing process, when carried out in outpatient health service institutions, corresponds to what is called nursing consultation, organized into five stages. First, nursing history. Second, nursing diagnosis. Third, nursing planning. Fourth, implementation of nursing care. And fifth, evaluation. Seven, in the nursing consultations of this report, the following clinical protocols were used as support for professional conduct, COVID-19 Guide for Primary Health Care Professionals, Florianopolis Version, 8, Attention to Spontaneous Demand for Adult Care, 9, and Attention to Demand for Child Care, 10. In the nursing history, information about the user and their responses to the health and illness process was obtained, 7. The patient was encouraged to express their ideas, doubts, and expectations regarding their health situation and health complaints in the face of the pandemic scenario. At this point, it was verified whether the user met the criteria for a suspected case of COVID-19 and the possibility of other infectious pathologies presenting with fever was assessed. After the clinical interview, a focused physical examination was performed on the patient's demands, investigating signs of alertness slash gravity. 8. For the nursing diagnosis, the interpretation of the data collected in the nursing history was performed. 7. Nursing diagnoses were performed according to the International Classification for Nursing Practice, ICNP. 11. A theoretical framework also adopted by the Municipal Health Department of Florianopolis. At this point, suspected cases of COVID-19 and contacts with positive cases were identified. 8. In the nursing planning stage, the expected outcomes for patient care and nursing interventions to be implemented were determined, and in the implementation stage, the interventions planned were carried out. 7. In the implementation stage, 
suspected cases of COVID-19, ICD-10B97.2, and contacts with confirmed cases of COVID-19, ICD-10U07.9, were reported using the International Classification of Diseases, ICD, List 8. During the nursing assessment, the responses of the user or family member slash caregiver, in the case of pediatric care, to the interventions were evaluated to determine if the expected outcome was achieved. Based on this assessment, adaptations were made to the stages of the nursing process. 7. For cases where CID-10B97.2 was reported, patients were contacted via teleconsultation 3, 7, 10, and 14 days after the onset of symptoms for evaluation. 8. A portfolio was created with notes about the personal experiences encountered during the professional practice in caring for individuals with COVID-19 symptoms without making any annotations about the patient, such as name, phone number, contact, or any personal information. The focus of the report concerning ethical precepts was on describing the professional experience within the context of nursing consultation. Therefore, due to the absence of associated research, the need for submitting the project to a human research ethics committee was waived. During the nursing assessment, the responses of the user or family member slash caregiver, in the case of pediatric care, to the interventions were evaluated to determine if the expected outcome was achieved. Based on this assessment, adaptations were made to the stages of the nursing process. 7. For cases where CID-10B97.2 was reported, patients were contacted via teleconsultation 3, 7, 10, and 14 days after the onset of symptoms for evaluation 8. A portfolio was created with notes about the personal experiences encountered during the professional practice in caring for individuals with COVID-19 symptoms without making any annotations about the patient, such as name, phone number, contact, or any personal information. The focus of the report concerning ethical precepts was on describing the professional experience within the context of nursing consultation. Therefore, due to the absence of associated research, the need for submitting the project to a Human Research Ethics Committee was waived. Results. To provide a safe environment for both healthcare professionals and patients, attention was given to the organization of the space, designated at the Primary Healthcare Unit, PHCU, as the Respiratory Symptomatic Clinic, RSC, where exclusive care was provided to individuals with respiratory symptoms and or contact with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases. Additionally, Training was conducted for the healthcare team and cleaning staff regarding concurrent and terminal disinfection routines. Every day, following an assessment ensuring the safety of the Respiratory Symptomatic Clinic, RSC, for patients, which included terminal disinfection by the cleaning staff before the primary healthcare unit, PHCU, opening, nursing consultations with users commenced. The spontaneous and scheduled appointments had a minimum duration of 15 minutes and a maximum of 40 minutes depending on the issues brought by the patient. Patients who contacted one of the nurses from the UBS ESF teams by phone call, via the messaging app WhatsApp or email, and were identified as needing in-person care, had their appointments scheduled for the same shift or day. During the nursing consultations, communication skills techniques such as silence, emotional echoing, summarizing, and nonverbal language were employed during the nursing history-taking process, demonstrating openness and understanding to encourage the patient to share their experiences regarding the health disease process. Regarding the biopsychosocial needs of the users during consultations, it was possible to identify among the most common situations. Concern about being away from work activities for fear of losing their jobs, with this situation being perceived more frequently among those without formal employment contracts. Fear of death. Fear of contracting COVID-19. Fear of transmitting it to others, especially when living with children, pregnant women, and individuals with chronic illnesses, sadness and anxiety resulting from social distancing, home confinement or isolation, depending on each case, and lack of support network to implement home confinement or isolation. To address the challenges posed by the pandemic, some strategies used by users were observed, including faith in God, practicing meditation and yoga, making video calls with family and friends, seeking counseling or psychiatric support through teleconsultations, 
engaging in Pilates and other forms of physical exercise through online platforms with qualified professionals, such as physical educators or physiotherapists. Limited financial resources resulted in fewer opportunities to manage stress and anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was noteworthy that some users who were in home isolation were identified by members of the health team as frequenting gyms and other social spaces. This reality generated a feeling of professional helplessness, as I noticed that, despite taking actions to disseminate information promoting learning about the topic within the community, there were still actions by citizens that contradicted the sanitary efforts to combat the pandemic. When a breach of home isolation was identified, the user was contacted for reassessment of the case, and the incident was reported to the epidemiological surveillance. During the physical examination, focused on the patient's demands and investigating signs of alertness or severity, various symptoms were observed, either individually or concurrently. Fever, feverish sensation, shortness of breath, sore throat, runny nose, alteration or loss of taste, agusia or smell, anosmia, muscle pain, headache, and diarrhea. The consultations with individuals who had contact with a positive COVID-19 case were primarily conducted via teleconsultation. When the patient exhibited physical examination findings, such as oral lesions or signs and symptoms caused by uncontrolled chronic diseases, which justified the fever and other symptoms, the family and community physician, MFC, was consulted for a shared consultation slash assessment. Other cases in which shared care was provided with MFC included the presence of alarm slash emergency signs or a patient who could not engage in telework and required a medical certificate to present to the hiring company. The collaborative work with the MFC was of utmost importance for resolving cases that required assessment by this professional. Among the implemented actions, we requested tests to identify infection by SARS-CoV-2. In this regard, for cases where symptoms were present for less than eight days, we requested reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, testing to be conducted between the third and seventh day of symptoms. Similarly, until June 2020, when symptoms persisted for more than eight days, and subsequently from June onwards, when they persisted for 10 days or more, a rapid antibody test for the novel coronavirus was conducted using whole blood obtained by finger stick. It was observed that the belief that infection with SARS-CoV-2 conferred acquired immunity, thereby eliminating the possibility of future infection with this virus, led some individuals with mild respiratory symptoms to desire a positive test result for SARS-CoV-2 infection. The nursing diagnoses used in the consultations, according to the SIP-12, are described in Table 1. Table 1. Nursing Diagnoses, Codes, and Definitions According to SIP Version 2017, Florianopolis, SC, Brazil, 2020. Diagnosis. Anxiety, fear, fear of death, diarrhea, dyspnea, pain, fatigue, lack of family support, lack of social support, lack of disease knowledge, fever, weakness, mood, depressed, infection, impaired olfaction, impaired taste, risk of dehydration, risk of disease, risk of infection, cough, sadness. After the nursing diagnosis, the problem was explained to the patient, family member, or caregiver in easily understandable language, using communication skills techniques to ensure their comprehension. Then, we proceeded to nursing planning and the implementation of nursing care in a shared manner with the users. All suspected or confirmed cases of the new coronavirus, ICD, 10B97.2, and contacts with positive cases of COVID-19, ICD, 10U07.9, were compulsorily reported. As nursing prescriptions included medications for pain and fever relief, paracetamol or dipyrone, a spoonful of honey as needed for cough relief, provided the patient did not have diabetes mellitus. Ways to manage dehydration, oral rehydration salt when at risk of dehydration, health education about COVID-19, strategies for managing anxiety, stress, sadness, and fear, including fear of death, health education about social services in the municipality of Florianopolis to support effective, restriction and home isolation, management of diarrhea, pain and fever, promotion of family support by identifying with the patient family members who could be contacted to assist in implementing restriction or home isolation. By the end of November 2020, 
During face-to-face -face consultations, it was necessary to refer one patient with signs of COVID-19 for hospital care and three to the emergency care unit, UPA, for evaluation. With discussions in the media about the use of medications such as ivermectin, azithromycin, and hydroxychloroquine as early treatment for COVID-19, some patients requested prescriptions for these drugs out of fear of acquiring or developing severe symptoms of the disease. When these requests occurred, first the current scientific literature regarding COVID-19 treatment was discussed. And if the patient still desired the use of any of these medications, the family physician was consulted for shared decision-making. It's worth noting that in rare situations during these shared consultations between the nurse and family physician, the patient asserted the use of the previously mentioned medications as their right regardless of the physician's clinical judgment, and the decision not to prescribe was interpreted as a refusal of care. The decision to prescribe the medication was the responsibility of the family physician. The professional guided the nurse's physical examination during the appointments, as well as the clinical interventions based on the findings. At the end of the appointments, efforts were made to establish a safety net by making it clear to the patient that, in case of any doubts, they could contact the professional or the healthcare team through the team's WhatsApp number. Additionally, if the UBS were closed, they could call the Florianopolis Health Hotline. However, in case of sudden shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, they should contact the Emergency Mobile Service, SAMU, at 192 or seek urgent care. In the UBS described in this account, each ESF team has a cell phone. Therefore, nursing assessment was conducted through teleconsultations via WhatsApp, phone calls, or video calls, ensuring that the patient complied with home restriction or isolation, depending on the case, thus reducing the risk of transmission of the novel coronavirus. Inquired about the symptoms the patient was experiencing, health complaints, improvements in clinical conditions, and results of the implemented care. The patient's PT-PCR test results, when available, were reported to them. Reinforcement regarding home isolation precautions was provided, and when appropriate, information about the disease's resolution and discontinuation of home isolation was conveyed. During the teleconsultation, the stages of the nursing assessment were followed, albeit with some limitations such as restricted physical examination. In the nursing assessment, decisions were made in collaboration with the patient regarding any necessary changes in care based on the new findings. Whenever it was determined that the patient did not have a coronavirus infection or had recovered from the disease, the importance of preventive measures against COVID-19 was reinforced.it was possible to perceive the satisfaction of the users with the monitoring of the health disease process by the nurse in the primary health care, PHC. Due to receiving positive feedback, including through messages and calls expressing gratitude and praising the care received. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant impact on the healthcare systems of various countries, overloading them at different levels of care. In Brazil, primary health care, APS, is often the first point of contact for individuals seeking healthcare services, strengthening the capacity for care provision to individuals with suspected and or confirmed COVID-19 in APS enables appropriate utilization of high complexity resources at the tertiary level, ensuring access for severe cases requiring interventions with higher technological density. The Ministry of Health emphasizes the importance of primary healthcare, PHC, in the clinical management of COVID-19 and points out that after screening Users with flu-like symptoms should be referred for assessment by a nurse or doctor, but it is essential to conduct a medical consultation for severity stratification through history taking and physical examination. It is noteworthy that, in the municipality described in this account, the management provides extensive autonomy to the nurse through an assistance protocol, in which the professional is responsible for history taking, physical examination, requesting tests, reporting suspected and or confirmed cases of COVID-19, and prescribing medications when attending to a user with flu-like symptoms, with medical professional consultation only being carried out in specific situations. The Pan American Health Organization emphasizes Advanced Practice Nursing, APN, which provides greater autonomy to nurses, as essential to achieving universal health coverage, and has been supporting Brazil since 2015 in consolidating APN in the country. The present account demonstrates the autonomy of the nurse in caring for individuals with mild COVID-19 symptoms in primary health care, supported by municipal protocols, ensuring access to and effectiveness of the service.
This reality prompts reflection on the importance of the nurse's clinical role in addressing the health needs of the population and in confronting COVID-19, as well as efforts to expand and legalize nursing care practices given their pivotal role in healthcare. These discussions among members of the Ministry of Health are crucial. In the current pandemic scenario, the nursing process has showcased the nurse's role in guiding the systematization of nursing care, supported by municipal protocols, as well as fostering collaborative practices between nurses and family and community medicine, MFC. These protocols have strengthened professional autonomy, with scientific grounding enhancing the execution of best practices, quality of care, and assertive approaches in patient management. This contrasts with findings from a study 15, revealing constraints nurses face when adhering to healthcare protocols. The comprehensiveness of care and the use of communication skills tools facilitated praxis and contributed to a relationship of trust between all parties, demystifying empirical knowledge about the disease. This aligns with studies conducted with individuals with chronic diseases regarding the importance of nursing consultations. Through clinical communication, nurses can also fulfill their role as health educators, addressing measures such as social distancing, isolation, and home restriction, focusing on COVID-19 prevention. It was necessary to clarify to patients that the treatment protocols for individuals with symptoms of. The treatment protocols for individuals with COVID-19 symptoms follow the recommendations of important current international scientific literature, 17 to 19 as well as the fact that despite many politicians continuing to insist on the use of chloroquine slash hydroxychloroquine for all COVID-19 patients, 20, scientific findings demonstrate that these medications are not effective in mild cases, 21, nor are they capable of reducing the severity of the disease, 22, as they have proven ineffective even in hospitalized patients, 23 to 24, highlighting the need for further studies to implement their use in treatment protocols. In every process of health education and care, the user is autonomous in their decision-making process. The clinical practice of healthcare organizations in Brazil underwent drastic changes during the pandemic, and to ensure precautionary measures, social isolation was implemented, leading to the establishment of telemedicine by Ordinance No. 467, 25. In this study, telenursing as a working tool was used to ensure the transition of care, thus guaranteeing the coordination and continuity of care for users. Conclusion. In the context of primary health care, PHC, the role of the nurse is essential in providing care and health surveillance to individuals and communities, working as part of a team and utilizing instruments that facilitate this work process. In this scenario of health crisis imposed by the coronavirus pandemic, the importance of strengthening the autonomy and working conditions of these professionals becomes evident. The nursing process supported by care protocols enabled professional autonomy and effective care for users with COVID-19 symptoms in primary health care during the pandemic caused by the coronavirus. Care management provided quality assistance, care coordination, and continuity of care. The present account underscores the importance of management tools and regulations that ensure the autonomy of nurses in addressing public health issues. It is hoped that this experiential account will inspire researchers to conduct studies with different methodological approaches addressing nursing care in primary health care, PHC, during the COVID-19 pandemic. The aim is to identify professional practices, advances in extended clinical care, and the impact on access to healthcare services and the quality of user assistance. If you want to see the citation of the article, it will be in the video description. The development of vaccines is a rigorous process that involves scientific research, rigorous testing, and regulatory approval. Vaccines are created based on antigens, which can be parts of the virus itself, such as proteins or sugars, or the weakened or inactivated virus. Ingredients such as preservatives, stabilizers, and surfactants are added to ensure the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. Clinical trials are conducted in three phases to assess the safety and efficacy of the vaccine in humans. That's why the process is quite time-consuming. So we have another stage, vaccine distribution. And distribution is based on priority groups defined by the National Plan for the Operationalization of COVID-19 Vaccination, PNO. Doses are allocated based on the population estimate of these groups and the weekly availability of vaccines. National vaccines. In addition to imported vaccines, 
the development of national vaccines is a priority to ensure effective immunization against COVID-19. And experimental studies on COVID-19 aim to, to describe the global landscape of experimental studies related to COVID-19. Methods. Descriptive study, conducted in April 2020, based on a search of clinical trial records on the clinical trials and Brazilian clinical trials registry portals. Statistical analysis was descriptive. Out of the 645 clinical trials in the sample, there was a predominance of 199, 30.9%, from Europe. Among the 645 clinical trials analyzed, 213, 33%, were conducted by hospital institutions, with 482, 74.7%, having a treatment-oriented objective. Regarding the interventions investigated, 394, 61.1% focused on medications, 70, 10.8% on biological interventions, 45, 7% on blood and derivative interventions, 40, 6.2% on behavioral interventions, 38, 5.9% on equipment interventions, 31, 4.8% on procedural slash assistance interventions, 18, 2.8% on diagnostic interventions, and 9, 1.4% on dietary supplementation interventions. It was observed that in 515, 79.8% of the trials, the studied population consisted of adults and the elderly, with 635, 98.4% investigating both sexes. Among these, 480, 74.4% trials included randomization, 482, 74.7% had parallel allocation of participants and 373, 57.8% did not have blinding. The conclusion drawn from the experimental studies on COVID-19 is that they predominantly originated from Europe, conducted by hospitals, focusing on treatment in adults and the elderly, with randomization but without blinding. The findings could guide the conduct of further studies to address the identified gaps. And there were global challenges, but each country used some strategies to address them. South Korea implemented mass testing and tracing of suspected cases early in the pandemic. These measures helped to contain the spread of the virus and prevent an uncontrolled outbreak. China implemented a draconian response, including strict lockdowns and social isolation. The government's swift action was praised by the World Health Organization, WHO, but also sparked controversy. New Zealand was considered an exemplary example in responding to the pandemic. Implemented early lockdowns, widespread testing, and effective contact tracing, resulting in low numbers of cases and deaths. Vietnam recorded only 35 deaths from coronavirus in a population of 95 million. Its rapid and effective response included strict isolation, testing, and contact tracing. United States and United Kingdom faced significant challenges and were described as being out of control. The pandemic exposed deficiencies in their response strategies. And there are still issues like misinformation and political challenges faced. The spread of false and misleading information about COVID-19 has been a significant challenge. Misinformation affects adherence to public health measures, trust in institutions, and the correct understanding of the pandemic. Political challenges. The pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities in the political systems of many countries. Challenges include epistemic contestation, political polarization, and institutional distrust. The pursuit of effective solutions is often hindered by partisan agendas and economic interests. Political challenges. The pandemic has revealed weaknesses in the political systems of numerous countries. Challenges include disputes over knowledge, political divisions, and lack of trust in institutions. Efforts to find effective solutions are frequently impeded by partisan agendas and economic interests. Media plays a significant role in disseminating information. It's crucial for media outlets to be responsible, verify sources, and avoid amplifying false information. Healthcare systems are becoming overwhelmed. The surge in COVID-19 cases has strained healthcare systems worldwide. During the first year of the pandemic, it's estimated that there were 4.5 million excess deaths. 
These statistics reveal the significant impact of the pandemic on healthcare systems, restricting access to essential services in many cases. Before the pandemic, there were encouraging advances in areas such as maternal and child health, communicable diseases, and access to clean water. However, interruptions in health services during COVID-19 have increased deaths from tuberculosis and malaria. Additionally, the pandemic has affected global financial protection, with many people facing financial difficulties due to direct health care expenses. Primary health care and adequate financing are essential to address these challenges and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals for Health by 2030. But even with the challenges, we've learned a lot from COVID-19. Resilience and adaptation. The ability to adapt to challenging circumstances has been crucial. We've learned to be more flexible and resilient. Public health appreciation. The pandemic has underscored the importance of healthcare systems and the need to invest in prevention and preparedness. Solidarity and community. We have seen communities coming together to support the most vulnerable. We have learned that we are all interconnected and that our health depends on the health of everyone. Responsible use of technology. Technology played a crucial role in disseminating information and connecting with loved ones. We have learned to use it responsibly and critically, valuing the essential. The pandemic has prompted us to reassess what is essential in our lives. We have learned to value time with family, health, and simplicity. Preparation for future crises. We have learned that preparation for crises is essential. We must invest in research, infrastructure, and global collaboration. But there are reasons to maintain hope and look to the future with optimism due to scientific advances. The rapid development of several effective vaccines against COVID-19 is a testament to the power of science and global collaboration. This gives us hope to face future health threats. We also learned solidarity and community. The pandemic has shown us that when we come together, we are stronger. Solidarity among nations, communities, and individuals is a source of hope. Human resilience. The stories of overcoming, compassion, and resilience during the pandemic are inspiring. They remind us of our ability to face adversity. Technological innovation. The acceleration of telemedicine, online education, and remote work has shown us that we can adapt and innovate in challenging times. Environmental awareness. The pandemic has prompted us to reflect on our impact on the environment. Many are seeking sustainable solutions for a better future. Collective learning. The lessons learned during the pandemic will help us be better prepared for future health and social crises. So let's keep hope alive, take care of each other, and work together for a healthier and more resilient future.